uh, y'all can go ahead and take a seat. Uh, today is always an exciting day, and I'm so glad that y'all are uh, here to worship alongside of us today. Um, uh, but today is always, and, and you'll hear me say this a little bit more a little bit later in the service, it's always an uh, exciting day. It's always a bittersweet day for me as a student pastor because I see some students um, doing exactly what they're supposed to do. And that is growing up, that is maturing in their faith, that is maturing in life, that is going on to the next phase of life. And as excited as we are to see them go, uh, it, it is just as sad to see them go. Um, but again, we'll talk about that a little bit later in the service. Uh, I am excited that you are here, as I said, to worship alongside of us. If this is your first time to worship with us here at Highland, if you are a guest and have never gotten one before, I encourage you to stop by our welcome center in the foyer in the back of the sanctuary. And, um, after the service, uh, some of our deacons will be back there, and they will have a gift for you. They would love to shake your hand, get to know you a little bit better. Um, just something from us to you to say welcome, and we encourage you to come back. Um, but again, just want to say welcome. There are two announcements I want to make sure that you're aware of, uh, both involving tonight. Number one is if you are a youth parent, and I'm talking youth now, or if you have sixth graders who will be in the youth next year, uh, at 515 in the youth room this evening, I would love to meet with you and kind of go over what our schedule will look like this summer. I have some stuff for you to take home. Uh, just kind of an informative meeting. Uh, that's at 515 in the youth room downstairs. Um, and also this evening at 6 o'clock, back in this very room, we will go, we're going to be led in worship by our young people. And when I say young people, I'm talking like young people. Uh, it's going to be a great time of worship as our children's choirs lead us in worship this evening. And so I know you're going to want to hear to be a part of that. Uh, it's just going to be, like I said, such a sweet time of fellowship and worship. So I encourage you, 515 youth parent meeting, uh, 6 o'clock, worship in here. Uh, again, excited that you are here. Excited to worship alongside of you. Thank you for being here.
with me, please, as we open and look at God's Word together. This morning, we're going to be coming from two different passages of Scripture. First, we'll be looking at Jeremiah, chapter 29, verses 11 through 13. And then, if you would, um, afterwards, we will flip over to Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 20 through 24. Starting with Jeremiah, chapter uh, chapter 29, verses 11 through 13. Verse 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a, and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And then Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 20. It says, But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming you have heard about him and were taught in him as to the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness." May God bless the reading of his word. Will you pray with me, please? Lord God, we love you so much. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy, Lord. We thank you for the new self that you have given us, Lord, that we, as your children, can celebrate you as a new creation, not as as anything other than a son or a daughter of you, King Jesus. Lord, I pray right now that your word will change lives. Your word will give life as we know that it does. Lord, if there is anyone in here this morning that does not know you, that does not have a relationship with you, if there's anyone watching online that does not understand what it means to be saved by your grace and your mercy, to be living as a new creation, to be living a life of hope and assurance. Lord, I pray that today will be the day that you reach down. I pray that today will be the day that, that they say yes to you. Lord, we know that you are the almighty creator, heavenly father, giver of life, author and perfecter of our faith. Lord, all good things are from you. And Lord, I pray that we never, never settle for anything less than you. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We give you all glory and honor. Amen.
I said, um, it seems like every year that I'm here, every year that I spend here, it gets a little harder on this day um, because that's one more year I've gotten to know the students who are graduating. That's one more year I've gotten to invest in their life um, and I've gotten to see them grow. I've gotten to see them mature in their walk with Christ and I've gotten to see them um, I've just gotten to see the desire in their heart grow to be more and more like Jesus. I've gotten to see over the past two plus years um, scripture manifest in these girls' lives. Passages where we are called to be ambassadors of Christ. Passages where we're called to be imitators of Christ have gone from words to a lifestyle. And to see that truth manifest in these lives is, is man, it's why I do what I do. It, it, God calls each and every one of us. Um, there is no denying that truth. He calls each and every one of us um, to his plan and to his purpose. And to see these young ladies understand that more in their life over the last couple of years has just been an incredible experience for me. Um, these two young ladies are not strangers to y'all. Um, I got them to write down some information just in case, because um, I wanted y'all to know not only where they're coming from, but where they're going. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a little bit of information about them, where they went to school, some of the things that they've accomplished, where they're going, what their future plans are. Um, and then we have, as a church body, we have a purchase them a gift, a Bible, um, because there is no nothing greater in this world um, for them to count on, for them to lean on as they move forward than God's written truth. Um, Yeah. So um, just in case you don't know, um, the one standing directly beside me is Abigail Grace Averick. Um, She is the daughter of Melanie and Jimmy Doolittle. Uh, She attended, I guess for the next five days, attends Northeast High School um, here in Lauderdale County. Um, some of the awards that she's received, some of the things that she's accomplished over the last several years. Uh, she is valedictorian of her senior class. She's been a member of the National Honor Society, the Beta Club. Uh, she was first in district and second in state for Health Occupation Students of America Medical Terminology. I got it right? Okay, cool. Um, and some of her future plans are she plans on attending Mississippi College in the fall and majoring in biology with an emphasis in pre-med. So, Abigail. And this is Camille Kennard. Uh, she is a daughter of Laurie and David Kennard. Uh, she has attended, will attend for the next few days, Clarkdale High School. Um, some of the awards, some of the things that she's accomplished, uh, she has been a member of the National Honor Society, the Spanish Honor Society, uh, um, distinguished young woman, first alternate, and got the Spirit Award, and she is the Miss uh, Clarkdale High School um, Tennis Award and uh, the Senior Class Secretary. Uh, Her plans are to attend Mississippi State University in the fall and to major in biomedical engineering. So, Camille. Um, Every year, uh, I don't know if y'all are aware of this, if you have a child who's graduated, I'm sure you're aware of this, but uh, we have a scholarship program for our graduating seniors here at um, Highland Baptist, uh, and it's something, if you've got a student coming up over the next few years, or in my case, 15, I'm already looking forward to it, uh, th- there is some money available for your kids graduating. Uh, this year, just so that y'all uh, know that um, both of our girls received each um, just shy of $4,000, $3,781 to be exact, uh, to go toward their tuition for the future, so... Um, and we, we were just so excited about that, and I talked to the parents, and I know that they are very excited about that. Um, so just something that you're aware of, and know where some of your money goes as you give to the church, as you give toward these certain endowed scholarships. Um, it goes to the, toward the educational future of our students here. So thank you for giving to that. Um, I'm not sure if y'all are aware of this. Uh, maybe you are, maybe you are not. Um, your job in as the church family for these students, even though 
you won't see them near as often come the fall. Um, even though they, they may even move their church membership to a local church body where they are going to be living for the next several years. Your responsibility as their faith family has not ended today. It will not end in the fall in August when they move to Clinton, when they move to Starkville. Your responsib- our responsibility as their faith family carries on. One of my favorite passages in this regard can be found in 2 Timothy. Paul is writing to Timothy. Um, <clears throat> and he addresses not only Timothy at the beginning of this chapter, but he addresses the people who've been invested in his life, who have watched him grow and mature in the faith. And this is what he has to say in 2 Timothy 1, starting in verse 3. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors with clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Again, this is Paul talking to Timothy, somebody that he has been um, mentoring, somebody that he has been um, investing in, watching him grow in the faith. And the first thing he does, obviously, here is he says, I thank God for you. I I, I pray for you night and day. And then he goes on to say in verse 4, as I remember with tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands, of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. So what is one of the first things that Paul says to Timothy in this letter? I thank God for you. I pray for you night and day, and I'm thankful and grateful for the spirit that dwells in you, just like it did in your mother and your grandmother. I'm grateful that there were people pouring into you as you grew and as you mature. Guys, we are the Eunice and Lois that Paul is talking about here. The spirit of Christ indwells us, and we have a responsibility to the young people in this church. We have a responsibility to the ones who are graduating as we have invested in them, as we have poured into them, hopefully as we have been praying for them and loving on them, that job is not over. We continue to invest, we continue to love on, we continue to pour into, we continue most importantly to pray for. I am blown away by you as a faith family, by how I've seen you invest in and pour into the students over the last few years that I've been here. And I'm continually blown away by the fact that y'all don't cease to do that whenever they graduate and move off and continue their life. And I just want to remind you of that truth. I want to encourage you to continue to pray for, to invest in, to love on. I want you to remember that our job is not to see them turn 18 and then move away and be done with them. Our job is to continue to pray on, to lift up, to invest in, to love on. Guys, thank you all for being such a loving faith family to our students. Thank you for continuing to invest in our students as they graduate. If you would allow me to, Camille, Abigail, I would love to pray over you all one last time this morning. Father, thank you. Thank you for these young ladies. Thank you for... Thank you for the undeniable truth that resides in them, the desire that they have to see you lifted high and glorified, the desire that they have to settle for nothing less than the best, knowing full well that you are the best, because you are better than what this world has to offer. You are better than any of the pleasures of this world. Lord, I thank you, and I pray that they will continue to seek after you, Lord. I pray for us as the body here at Highland. I pray that we will continue to pray over them. We will continue to love on them. We will continue to encourage them and invest in them. And, Lord, we will continue to desire the best for them, knowing again that you are the best. Lord, let us settle for nothing less than you. We love you, Nancy, and then we pray. Amen.
thank you for the day that you've given us, Lord, for the many, many blessings that, that you've given us. Lord, just thank you so much for these graduates. Just uh, be with Abigail and Camille as they begin another chapter in their life. Just watch over them and guide them, Lord. May they continue to look to you for guidance and strength. Now, Lord, be with Dr. Park as he delivers the message you placed on his heart. Speak through him. Bless these tithes and offerings we're about to receive, Lord. May they be used to glorify you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
was sprinkled a Methodist, but I'm happy that I don't preach as a Methodist because then I'd be wearing this every Sunday. And it's, I don't know how the Methodists do it, but I like a coat and tie better. But for today, why not? Dr. Chuck Missler has identified four basic questions of life. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going when I die? Four basic questions which the Bible answers answers them all again and again and again. Identity, who am I? Origin, where did I come from? Purpose, why am I here? And destiny, where am I going when I die? This morning, on this auspicious occasion, Graduate Recognition Sunday. As you've already heard, because Clint read the text, our focus is two biblical passages, a total of eight verses. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 through 13, and Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 to 24. We have been blessed to have these young ladies graduating from high school. I'm selfish because happily I can say I'll see Abigail. I will. And I'm sad to say that I couldn't twist Camille's arm enough to convince her to go to Mississippi College. Instead, she did the right thing, followed God's lead, and is going to Mississippi State. You also note, according to the order of service, the evangel, that we also have seven graduating from college. I can see Molly McCarty here. Are there other college graduates who are as well here? There's a total of seven. Molly, are you the only one? Okay, so it's an auspicious occasion that we recognize all of our graduates, a total of nine. And these texts, I concede, at first glance, appear unrelated, seem disparate. Old Testament prophecy, Jeremiah. New Testament letter, Ephesians. Jeremiah chapter 29, however, specifically verses 4 to 23, and we're only reading three of those verses, is actually a letter, so somewhat of a connection. Jeremiah chapter 29 is a letter, and Ephesians, of course, all of it is a letter. A message of hope, future tense, when one reads Jeremiah chapter 29, specifically verses 11 through 13. Instructions for daily living, present tense, as one reads Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 to 24. Different audiences, periods of time, and location. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 through 13, first read by Judeans, exiled, that means far from home, held against their will in Babylon, 6th century B.C. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 to 24, first read by Asians, at home, not exiled, at home on the eastern shore of the Aegean Sea in the first century AD. At first glance, the texts this morning seem unrelated, appear disparate. 
They, however, despite their differences, Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 through 13, and Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 to 24, they together address God's purpose for you. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, where I begin, if you're wondering, am I in Ephesians right now? Do, do I go to Jeremiah? I'll lead you. Right now, we're in Jeremiah. Hopefully, you can keep your place in two different parts of the Bible. If not, just listen. Don't stress. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, announces good news. Good news. You and I have a future from God, with God, a reason to be hopeful. Notice two nouns that appear together in verse 11. God speaks through the prophet Jeremiah. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for well-being and not for calamity to give you, here's the first noun, a future, and don't miss the second noun, joined by the conjunction, and a hope, a future and a hope. In the Old Testament, one will find these two nouns together just three other times. So what kind of future do we have from God and with God? A good future, a future that gives us reason to hope. And I hope you understand, not everybody has a hopeful future. When the criminal hears the sentence, life in prison without parole, that's a future. But that's not a hopeful future. When sometimes a patient, as a result of genetics or lifestyle choices, because medical science does not have a treatment plan, when a patient hears the prognosis, that is a future, but it's not necessarily a reason to be hopeful. The good news that Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 announces to our graduates today, as well as to our church today, is that we all have a reason to be hopeful because God has provided for us a future, not just from him, but with him. I want you to notice that his plans have never been generic. You know, a pre-packaged, one-size-fits-all, scribbled with a Sharpie. In the Hebrew text, in verse 11, the Hebrew verb that is pronounced kashav, it can be translated to plan or to devise. It is, in verse 11, a participle. And I know that our graduates know what participles are. You, church, also know because you have heard me over and over again talk about how much I like grammar. The participle conveys continuous action. Literally, if I'm translating from the Hebrew text, literally God declares, I know the plans that I am devising, I am planning over you. In other words, it's in process, it's pending. It's not something prepackaged that he simply hands to you a one size fits all. You and I therefore, not just the graduates, but this church, you and I therefore have a choice to make. And it's a choice that we make every day. That choice is God's personalized plans or self-centered pursuits. 
And those choices are not compatible. The Apostle Paul, beginning in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, scolded the Ephesians. Yeah? Because the Ephesians had refused to make a choice, hoping that an either or, God's personalized plans, self centered pursuits, hoping that an either or could be a both and. I'm sad to tell you that either ors don't become both ends. So listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote, reading it again from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, and literally in the Greek, that's old man, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, or literally in the Greek, the new man, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. In case someone here is wondering, isn't the old self, because I'm now a new creation in Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, isn't that old self, that old man, dead? And I'm glad to tell you, dead, yes. Gone, no. Because you and I, have you realized, we're still on planet Earth? We're still stuck in the flesh, the old self is dead, but not gone. And you do know the dead can still distract. Ever inhaled roadkill skunk? Not an appetizing thought before lunch. The dead can still get our attention, and the dead, therefore, that old, dead self can still distract. In verse 22, that Greek verb, pathyro, which is translated to corrupt, and it's modifying the old self. Notice how verse 22 concludes, the old self, which is, it's a participle, this is continuous action, the old self, which is being corrupted, in other words, again, it's not an appetizing thought just before lunch, but the old self is getting stinkier. It is decaying, and it's therefore, believe it or not, becoming potentially a greater distraction. Going back to Jeremiah, no one, graduates and church, no one, either today, next year, or before you die, can make this choice for you. Remember the choice that you have to make. Every day, God's personalized plans or self-centered pursuits. Notice the pronoun you in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 12. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. According to verse 13 of Jeremiah chapter 29, choosing God's plans includes incentives. What is that incentive? You get God. You don't just get his plans, but you also get God himself. And I want you to notice as I read verse 13, the pronoun me three times. Verse 13, Jeremiah chapter 29, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. That leads to a question before the conclusion of the message this morning that I want not just the graduates, but I want you, Highland Baptist Church, to consider. It's a, it's a valid question. 
It's a pressing question. And the question is, because I've talked about these personalized plans that in process God is devising for you and for me. The question is, can we trust God's plans? Now you already know the answer, right? Sure. And that means you could say to me, let's end the sermon now, do the conclusion, and then we can be on our way. Of course that's not what preachers do. I will answer that question. Take a little bit more time, not a lot. But I want to provide two different examples by which I answer this question that you already know how to answer, and so do I. Can we trust God's plans? Recent scientific inquiry has balanced the vastness of the universe and the uniqueness of the earth. Billions of galaxies litter the black of space, each one full of solar systems. The logical conclusion which teachers have shared with students for decades, the universe is populated by innumerable Earth-like planets and perhaps innumerable forms of life. Question, does complex life, such as we are, easily spawn? And now, by a quick PowerPoint, maybe it'll work, this question, what makes the Earth, Earth-like? Next slide. Answer, approximately 20 factors determine our planet's viability, each one essential for life. And if you're straining to see, don't worry, there's no test after the sermon. What you're seeing is just 13 of the 20 characteristics that make our planet favorable for complex life. The next slide. The probability that all the factors precisely converge anywhere in the universe is astounding. It's one out of a thousandth of a trillion. That's one times 10 to the negative 15. That's one with 15 zeros past it. You have a much better chance of getting struck by lightning. You have a much better chance of winning the lottery. Don't do it. In other words, y'all, without a creator God ordering the details, complex life would not be possible on this planet or anywhere else in the universe. And what's my point? Here's my point. God painstakingly promoted our existence. Who therefore can comprehend the intricacy of his plans to promote our well-being. If he went to this much effort just for us to exist, how much more can we celebrate everything that he does so that we have well-being? Boggles the imagination of a child and transcends the ingenuity of science. You know, God created the heavens and the earth and his purpose for us to enjoy. You, you won't hear that necessarily in the public school. You certainly won't hear it in our media or from our politicians. The environmentalists have a loud voice today and they like to say, we human beings are a virus. The world would be better off without us. Whereas the Bible clearly says, this world was made for us. And we're the most important member of God's creation. Of course, you've heard these words. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Can we trust God's plans? Second and final illustration. But of course you already know the answer and so do I. Can we trust God's plans? America's favorite fisherman does. Jimmy Houston hails from eastern Oklahoma. Bass Angler of the Year twice. Member of the Fishing Hall of Fame. The Hall of Legendary Anglers. And the Pro Bass Angler Association Hall of Fame. Host of the successful TV show, Jimmy Houston Outdoors, author of three books, founder of Fellowship of Christian Anglers Society, and he has been deacon at First Southern Baptist Church in Keys, Oklahoma. You may or may not know that in 2003, that Bass Angler Sportsman Society signed a promotional agreement with Anheuser-Busch. That deal affected every tournament participant. Wear a Bush jacket and display a Bush boat decal. Jimmy Houston refused to comply. The lone holdout of 182 bass Anglers, and consequently, he could not qualify for the Bassmaster Classic Tournament, and he could not win Angler of the Year, which was a prize of $100,000. Jimmy, didn't you, didn't you pray about this? And Houston replied, no, I didn't pray about it. There was nothing to pray about. I didn't have a decision to make. I knew what I was supposed to do. You see, months earlier, before that agreement had ever been settled, Jimmy Houston had been a counselor at a rousing youth rally. Well, every youth rally is rousing. Bring your earplugs. Audio adrenaline. Clint, do you, do you even know who audio adrenaline is? Okay. Audio adrenaline, love them, in concert. Certainly, if they played, you brought your earplugs. The sponsor of that youth rally, his church. And dozens of kids walked the aisle that night, and he had the opportunity to lead one of them, a 12-year-old boy, to Jesus Christ. And after they had prayed together, the adolescent had a favor to ask. Will you talk to my dad about his drinking problem? Jimmy Houston could not refuse. And the concern of that boy for his father inspired Jimmy Houston to take a stand against Bass and against Bush. In an interview with Baptist Press, Jimmy Houston admitted, it feels like a kick in the head. That's what it feels like. It, it happens in business a thousand times. I've been through it. But thankfully, here's what he said. I'm not running things, God is. Can we trust God's plans, graduates? Absolutely. Can we trust God's plans for this church? Absolutely. Can you trust God's plans for your life today and tomorrow? For sure. Rick Warren, author of The Purpose Driven Life, notified the world. We were made for more than success. We were made for significance. God has a purpose for every life. So in the days of your youth, graduates, before the days of trouble come and the years draw near, I beseech you to remember the difference as I conclude. Remember this difference. Success dies with you, 
significance outlives you. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful that you do have wonderful plans for us. You know best. And that doesn't mean that we trust always. My own testimony has its ups and downs. Times when I thought I knew better and I chose and pursued my own way to my regret. The decision is easy, but we don't always do what is right. Have mercy. We pray today as we should pray every day, whether we're a graduate or not, fill us with your spirit. We are desperate for you. We're worse than desperate without you. We know with our head that you can do all things, that with men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Please convince us, persuade us, convict us to go your way and not our own. God, we've already prayed for the graduates and we need to keep praying for them. And so in part, this prayer is for them, that you would hold their hand and order their steps and surround them with your presence. Place them in the center of your will and may your will be done through them, not in spite of them. Such is my prayer, has been my prayer for this church. Once again, please, your will be done. Lord, our will is irrelevant. Our opinions and our preferences don't matter. Thank you that you pay no attention to them. Heaven and earth will pass away. Your word will not. Your will is done in heaven, may it be done on earth. Thank you that we have today. We can't, do on we can't undo yesterday, but we have today to say yes to you. We trust you. We want your personalized plans for us. Help us, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God's plan for you is that you have a personal relationship with him. And what boggles the mind is that our eternal God, the great I am, before there ever was a sin that happened in the Garden of Eden, before there ever was an Adam and Eve, the Son with the Father and the Spirit finalized the plans for our salvation so that we could have a relationship with Him. Because the Scripture clearly says that the Lamb of God, that refers to Jesus, crucified on a cross, the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. This is a God who takes no chances, who dots every I and crosses every T. Why? Because you and I matter to him. That should boggle our minds. He loves you that much. And took every effort to ensure that you would have a relationship with him. And yet he patiently awaits. He doesn't force you. He patiently waits, politely, the consummate gentleman, for you to say yes to him. He could make you, but he'd rather have your love, your choice to follow him. Would you make that ultimate decision today that not only affects this life, but the next? Clint and I would be thrilled to have the opportunity to speak to you in further detail about this great relationship that you could have with Jesus. But whatever your decision, if you need prayer, pray. If you need a church home, come. Whatever your decision, you do as God leads.